we're going to get started. So we'll do a little intro here in the beginning. So if people are trickling in still, you won't miss a whole lot at this point. So, um, so uh, welcome to our webinar. Um, again, my name is Rashid Patel. I'm the medical director at Freedom Health Works, and Jason Rutz is our par partnership and growth director, and he will be uh, doing his section here in just a little bit. Um, our agenda for today. Oops, is um, just to review uh, some of the basics about direct primary care. I'm assuming that most of you know a little bit about direct primary care or have uh, experience with this in the past, but there may be some newbies on there. So we'll be uh, reviewing just a little bit about what direct primary care is. And then we'll talk about Freedom Health Works ourselves and how we support DPC practices through their journey. And then I'm going to hand it over to Jason to talk about how Freedom Health Works connects with uh, connects practices with employers and then to review our current opportunities that we have. Um, here at Freedom Health Works. All right, so just a little bit about myself. Um, I finished my family medicine training in 2007 and worked with our local hospital network here for several years. Um, in 2015, I left and got my first taste of doing uh, healthcare outside of the insurance framework. So I worked with a company called Our Health, and they do a lot of employer-based uh, near-site and on-site clinics. So really opened my eyes on how we can provide care in a different manner that doesn't involve insurance coding and billing. Uh, but then about two years ago in 2017, I opened my own practice, Fisher's Direct Family Care, which is a DPC practice uh, right outside of Indianapolis here uh, in Indiana, and have been uh, working there and growing ever since. And I've been working with Freedom Health Works this year to help, uh, help us move the movement forward. So. Um, just a little bit about direct primary care. Um, again, most of you probably know this, but direct primary care, it's a primary care model where physicians work directly with patients without the influence of insurance companies or third party payers. And for the most part, that care is provided in a monthly membership model where we cover most of the primary care services for a fixed cost. So what that allows us to do is really move away from that fee for service or transactional environment in medicine and, and really be able to focus on more membership and relationships. Uh, we're able to move away from a fragmented uh, care where you may get care at multiple offices or different locations and really try to provide more holistic care in one office. Um, care in that traditional setting is often traditional because it's based on insurance billing and insurance codes and we really are able to embrace innovation and cost savings for the patient. Uh, some of the innovations that we're able to focus on, one definitely involves technology. So e-visits, telehealth, uh, mobile communications, a lot of these platforms that all of us are using already in any number of other venues, um, we're able to, uh, to use those within to, to provide care in our office. Um, obviously we have our, our simple face-to-face -face visits in the office, but we can actually expand on that um, and do things like group visits where we bring in groups of patients together that have similar health needs and work with them in a more uh, focused manner as opposed to doing the individual one-on-one -on -one visits. Um, and then really expand on the ancillary services as well. So really do more in-office testing, procedures, focus more on education and counseling for our patients. So really anything that we feel would help our patients be healthier, um, we're able to do that in our office and uh, not worry about how we're gonna bill for it because everything is covered in our monthly membership. What about some of the results? So some of you may have seen these results in the past uh, from the Q-Lion study. Um, really what DPC does is it, it really drives down a lot of the costs that uh, are associated with, with the excessive costs in our healthcare system. So things like fewer surgeries, specialty visits, uh, fewer visits and hospitalizations. Um, it it kind of makes sense. We already know this. The more and better primary care that you have, you're going to see a reduction in this. But we're starting to see some really good data that comes out that can really quantify this and really show the cost savings um, as we move forward. So ultimately, direct primary care, we provide high quality primary care. We're able to increase the flexibility on how we deliver it. Uh, we hopefully are saving time and money for ourselves and for our patients and really improving satisfaction across the board. Uh, for both ourselves and patients. So if you do have any further questions about direct primary care in general, uh, feel free to ask it in the question section, Q&A section, we'll maybe touch on that as we move forward. But I would like to focus and move towards Freedom Health Works and who we are and what we do. So our mission here at Freedom Health Works is to build a direct primary care ecosystem that allows physicians and consumers to thrive in a personal and high value approach to primary care. Now we do this across multiple ways. So we can work with um, whether a physician is in the launch phase, whether they're growing their practice, or maybe they're fully a mature practice and now just nurturing their practice. We can really work across that spectrum to help support your practice and bring value with the things that we do. And we really can do this across five different areas, uh, group services, analytics, peer support, uh, training and operations, and coordination. And we'll kind of go through all of these here individually. So let's start with uh, group services. Don't spend more than you need to. 
So this is probably where a lot of you, if you're thinking about a company like ours, are, are probably thinking of what we do. Uh, maybe help with some of the group purchasing and, and bringing in the value or the bringing our collective volume together to help with uh, with providing value to our offices. So things like medical supplies, labs, medications, imaging, um, all of those things, uh, once you kind of pool offices together, we're able to get better pricing on some of these items. And this may help with uh, pricing for ourselves in our office, or it may actually help with uh, saving money for our patients as well. And some of these things, uh, you know, you may be able to find uh, ways of doing on your own through other GPOs across the country. But we kind of take it a step further and really want to focus on some things that maybe we can't do as individual offices um, all the time. So one of the things that we've been able to, to set up is some vaccine management. Uh, we know that vaccines can be definitely uh, one of the challenging things that uh, DPC offices have in terms of the cost and, and getting that set up in our office. So we have a vaccine partner that will help front the cost of those vaccines and get them into our offices and will actually help us with some of the insurance billing um, that, that uh, will help our patients be able to pay for these vaccines as well. So that's really kind of a nice way and we have a system when we have multiple offices that we can rotate vaccines around to make sure we don't have expirations and to make sure that things are always in stock. So that's a, a nice ability to be able to share the resources amongst many offices to uh, provide vaccines for our patients. Um, we do the same thing with our software vendors. So we use a number of software platforms for whether it's for billing, for our, our patient records, uh, for our mobile communications. And so what we're able to do is really kind of try to get that enterprise level service and pricing for our practices. So um, I know there are ways to get all these software on an individual basis. Um, but sometimes working at, at an enterprise level, we have a, a new set of features and some of the things that maybe you don't get on a personal plan. And hopefully with, some, with that comes some cost savings um, as we um, are, are trying to pool the resources of all these practices together. And we're going to talk about analytics here in a second, but then we also um, have some softwares that, that would, can pull together the analytics that we do for all of these as well. So really trying to say, uh, you know, as we kind of work together with multiple offices, we try to pool the resources that we have to help uh, with pricing on a lot of the things that we do. So let's talk about analytics. Be sure your practice is running smoothly. So I think uh, those of us that have been, have been employed or maybe some of you are still in an employed position, I'm sure you're used to getting those weekly or monthly or quarterly reports of your quality metrics and your benchmarks. And I, I used to cringe when we used to get those because it was always a way of trying to, you know, whether it's take your bonus away or make you do things differently. Um, so now that we're out and, and running independently, I, I love that freedom, but then we start thinking about, well, actually, how do I know that I'm doing a good job? I'm not really quite sure. I could ask my patients. They may tell me that I'm doing a good job. They may um, say, you know, things are, are running smoothly, but I, I don't exactly know. So what we do is we have some software that can actually pull together data from all of the different software platforms that we use. So whether that's our billing platform, whether that's our EHR, our communications platform, and we're really, really able to get a good picture of how, our, how is our practice operating. So that may be, um, maybe we look at our collections and our, and our bill payment, maybe we can make sure that's working smoothly, um, maybe make sure that we're communicating well with our patients, answering phone calls on time, returning messages promptly. And so it kind of gives us a picture of how are things operating um, across the practice. And, and that's good by itself, it's good to see that data, but then the next step is how do I know that that's actually a good number? So what we do at Freedom Health Workers is, is we take that data and we can then benchmark it across multiple practices. So we can kind of compare that same those same metric across all the practices that we work with and say, hey, maybe you're doing really well in certain areas. Maybe you've you're got some challenges in other areas. And maybe some of those numbers, if we say this is a challenge, maybe is appropriate for your practice based on your patient panel and the, and the types of patients that you see, maybe that's an appropriate thing. So we're able to kind of analyze that data and really make the, the most of it to kind of get that sense. We then can actually look at patient engagement as well. We know that with a, a membership model, we want to make sure that our patients are getting the best value out of their membership. So we can look at some of those metrics and say, you know, who, who are the patients that maybe we haven't seen in a while? Maybe, uh, maybe they haven't been in for a visit. Maybe we haven't even called them or had a, a secure message with them in a while. So maybe we should reach out to check with them and make sure they're doing okay. Um, and, and maybe they are. Maybe they're doing totally fine and we don't need to see them. But it'd be nice for them to know that we've reached out and and that they are uh, getting a little bit of value from their membership there as well. And then same thing on the employer side. So Jason is going to talk a lot more about how we work with employers. But they want to see that uh, the, the money that they're spending on, on the DPC membership is being used appropriately as well. So they, they obviously look at cost savings. That's a number one thing that employers want to look for. 
But I think looking at employee utilization is, a, is, is good as well. So making sure that their employees are actually coming to our office and getting the services that we provide, making sure they're getting their screening tests done, making sure they're satisfied with the, the service offerings that we have. Um, these are all things that we can pool together and, and provide a report back to employers to say, hey, you're working with these DPC offices. I think your, your employees are taking good advantage of it and we're able to quantify that for them as well. So uh, a really big bucket of analytics that you know, may be a little bit more difficult for an individual office to, to look at or do on their own, um, but with our software vendors, we're able to pull that data, kind of really make the most of it and, and provide really meaningful reports back to you. Um, again, in our model, we don't own the practices, everyone's working on their own, but we're here to really provide the data back to help you run more smoothly and help as be as efficient as, as, as possible. So next up is peer support. Uh, don't practice on an island. Um, I think when we have been in our employed positions, we kind of had our built-in peers, whether they were the uh, uh, members in our office, the, our, uh, our, our coworkers there, maybe it was our peers as a, at an employed level with our physician group or our network that we used to work with. Um, so we'd have that built-in group of, of physicians to, to talk about items and, and kind of share stories with. And now that you're out on your own, sometimes you may feel a little bit more isolated. I don't have anybody that I work with directly I may have my professional societies or other things, but uh, there's no one else there to, to help uh, kind of run ideas off of. So what we have done, uh, we've started that here in the Indianapolis area with our group of physicians. We have uh, eight or so physicians that we've been able to put together in a cohort and, and kind of do some of this networking with. So one of the first things that we do are physician forums. Uh, we meet on a monthly basis and uh, it had been in person and we've kind of modified our format a little bit. We now do monthly uh, webinar forums, kind of very similar to this on a monthly basis at lunchtime, where we're able to pull the physicians together, talk about whether it's clinical topics, whether it's uh, topics about direct primary care and how we can have our offices run more efficiently. We kind of pull those together. And uh, then we still do kind of meet in person. So every third month we meet in person in the evening. So we have a little bit deeper discussion where we can maybe have a little bit of social interaction time. We have some time to maybe meet with a vendor who's got some, some new idea or some new product to um, share with our, our DPC offices and, uh, and, then, and then really deep dive into a more uh, clinically or, or practice management type topic as we're all together. So really kind of a nice way to start learning from each other and, and kind of having that support. Those same group of physicians kind of become a, a peer network now. So whenever I have questions of uh, I've got a, maybe a, a challenging clinical situation or I've got some scenario in my office with a challenging patient, maybe it's not clinical, but maybe it's, you know, they're running behind on their bill or they're messaging a little bit too often. How do, how do other physicians handle that? We now have this network of peers that I can then re re report to or call to say, hey, do you guys have any ideas of how we can handle this situation or what we wanna do for that? Um, we're able to, to kind of get that going as well. Um, getting feedback from the group. So one of the things we talked about the analytics we had in the, in the previous slide, um, one of the things that we do at the forum sometime is, is uh, really look at some of those analytics on an individual basis. So we may take one practice and really deep dive into the analytics of that practice, see what they're doing well, see what may be not working well, and then learning from everybody. So if there are things that our practice is doing really well, we want to learn how they're doing that. How, how are you so responsive with your messages? Is it because you have autoresponders? You know, what, what is it that you're doing that's working so well? Because we want to learn from that. Um, and maybe there's some areas of challenge. Maybe these things don't look as good on your, on your benchmarking reports. We as a group can help you as a practice figure out, you know, what can we do to, uh, what can you do to help it work better? And so we kind of are able to get that feedback across the group. And then finally, actually a little bit of clinical support as well. So a couple of things that we've started doing, um, you know, a lot of us run pretty lean offices. So for example, I, you know, we have one staff member in an office and if they call in sick one day and it's a busy day and we're kind of, who's going to be answering the phones. We now with some of our software platforms can route phone calls to a different office. So some, another office that may have extra clinical staff uh, can easily say, yeah, we'll help you answer phones for, for a few hours to get you caught up and help with that. Um, we also have different services in, in different offices. So um, being family physicians or, or primary care doctors, we all kind of have different niches and different specialties. And so one office may be doing you know, treadmill testing, somebody else is doing Botox, somebody else is doing something else. And as we work together, we then are able to provide a, a group of services to our patients that we may not all individually offer, but as a group of, of offices, we can then offer to our patients together. So it's been kind of nice to have some of that clinical support as well. All right, so moving on to training and operations, don't reinvent the wheel. So I think we have a, a lot of questions from uh, DPC or physicians who are looking to start DPC docs of, of kind of where do I start or how do I do this? So I think online you're, you're gonna find there's a lot of different training manuals and different uh, resources out there, guides and checklists. 
And, uh, and that's great. And I think we've compiled some of that as well um, into some of our, our, our DPC training. And so I think that's a great place to start. And so we have that available for any physician to learn from. Um, I think we take it one step further in that we're actually help, able to help you implement some of that as well. So I think it's one thing to kind of look at a checklist or look at a manual of here's the things that I should be doing. Um, but then if I actually need help to actually do some of those things, uh, we can step in at Freedom Health Works and really help you actually do some of those items uh, to help get your practice off the ground. Uh, we've taken it a step further and really have been looking intensely at our workflows in our office and really trying to find the best practices of how things happen. So whether it's uh, medication dispensing or lab ordering or patient rooming, we've taken a look at all these different workflows and, and kind of figured out what is the best practice uh, to do this. And we've actually, what we've looked at is how does this actually work best in a DC setting? When we look at some of the workflows that we may think from a traditional office, a lot of these are set because of insurance billing, because of meaningful use guidelines, because of just you know other reasons with that there may be why we have patients do certain things. In a DPC setting, we don't uh, have those boundaries. And so we kind of relook at kind of how do we approach some of the things that we do and we kind of take a different uh, approach to it. So we have some of that worked out. So it really helps to, uh, to work with us where we can go into practice and really give them all these ideas to help the practice be more efficient over time. And then finally in compliance as well. So this is something that when I was employed, I didn't really think about it a whole lot. Um, I got those alerts that once a year, I've got to do my HIPAA training type of thing. But now that I own my own practice and I'm a business owner, I've got to think about things like that. So not only on the medical side, so whether it's HIPAA compliance or making sure I have a CLIA waiver for my lab or making sure I'm disposing of my medical waste appropriately, but even just as a small business owner, I've got to make sure I have uh, you know, all my OSHA regulations up to date for my employees. Um, is my office ADA compliant? Um, all those types of things that um, any small business owner would need to, to think about. So we have kind of all of that compiled and ready to go and things of resources we can provide to help make sure that all of those um, items are up to date and that your office um, is as compliant as safe as possible. All right, and so the last thing here is the coordination. So expand your reach. Um, so Jason's going to touch on this a little bit more here, but you know we all kind of work in our own offices and we recruit patients and we do advertising and that, that really is great. But as we want to take DPC to the next level, we really are going to have to work on, on how do we expand our reach and go beyond. So that easily could be working with employers to get you know, large chunks of patients together, um, working with health, health sharing companies. So things like Sedera or Liberty HealthShare, those are uh, places where uh, you know, those, those companies are very interested in DPC because they know it helps save money for their patients and helps keep them healthy. And then really building those regional DPC communities. So when we think of a, a hospital network or a physician group um, in a traditional setting, they, they're able to take care of a lot of patients because they have a lot of variety amongst their providers. So male or female providers, MDs versus DOs, different interests like sports medicine or functional medicine. Um, any one individual DPC office will be challenged to provide all of that variety. But when we work together, as a network of DPC offices, um, we really can then provide that variety that any of those large employers or health sharing company would be looking for and are able to, to focus on that. So that really is uh, kind of one of the things that we're gonna, gonna work on as well. So with that, I'm gonna transition over to Jason to kind of build on that and, and move forward with uh, how we work with employers and what our opportunities are here. Okay, hi everybody. So I'm gonna try to transfer my screen. So let's hope this works. Let's see here. Okay, how's that? Yep, that looks good. Okay, so thanks Dr. Patel. Uh, my name is Jason Rutz, so I'm Partnership Director for Freedom HealthWorks. Yep. Jason, one thing I would just say is to close that Q&A window in front of your screen there. Close the Q&A window. Oh, there we go, we got it, Never mind. Okay, yeah, I don't see it in mine. Okay, um, so Dr. Patel talked about, a lot about um, kind of our services that we provide to practices on a long-term basis and how we launch those practices. What I wanna talk about is more of the how we do it and why we do it. And so uh, it really is a unified approach to direct primary care. But I'm, I'm kind of tying direct primary care to life cycle of industry. So this is just a, a kind of a, a, a curve that kind of illustrates what uh, industry goes through and what we can expect moving forward. And there are five different areas. So introduction, growth, shakeout, maturity, and decline. And, you know, obviously, I think in the DPC world right now, we're just in the introductory phase. And some of the traits of an introductory phase, uh, some, some of which can be called startup, of the life, life cycle of industry are 
One, outside of early adopters, awareness is really non-existent. So if you talk to 10 people walking down the street and ask them what direct primary care is, you may get nine out of nine, nine out of 10 or 10 out of 10 that don't know what that is. That's same, the same case for benefits consultants, for companies, um, for anybody looking to consume uh, primary care. And so that's one trait. It's not a bad trait, but that's one trait to show kind of where we're at right now. Innovation's in full swing. Um, so there's a lot of people trying to bring a lot of value uh, into direct primary care from the software side, um, uh, especially. So there's a lot of solutions, Hint, uh, Elation, some of our partners. Um, so those are always a good thing. And then providers of the service are still trying to hone the offering. So we're trying to find out, well, what, what really resonates with patients? How do we scale this? What are the services that our patients really want? Our, our patients, patients really want, excuse me, what are the things that can provide long-term value? Uh, the fourth trait is really the market is highly fragmented. So the DPC movement at this point is a lot of independent doctors that decided they're going to go ahead and launch their own practice and take, that, take on the risk of doing so. And there have been practices that have been successful. There have been pra practices that, that have been a little bit slower pace. And so, but the problem is, is that there's no, uh, there's no beginnings of a network effect. And kind of that's what we're looking to bring is the network effect, uh, you know, piece of direct primary care. And I'll kind of explain to this more. So obviously we want to move from introduction to growth. And when we get into the growth phase, that's when things start really getting fun for all of us. Uh, we'll probably have more opportunities than we know what to do with. And it gives a lot of opportunities for, for physicians uh, to be able to participate too. And because obviously they're driving this movement. But I think there's some things that, that will get in the way of that that we, we're kind of anticipating. And so uh, I guess the why do we feel that DPC needs to grow? So we, uh, by meaning we, I mean all the physicians uh, here, have an opportunity to change healthcare from the bottom up. And so, and, and obviously for the better, it's not just a change for change's sake, it's, it's really for the better and providing a much better experience uh, for patients and, and allow the doctors and the patients to make those crucial decisions together. It has an incredible potential to impact people's lives. And I don't think that's, you know, that's, uh, uh, you know, I, that really needs to be emphasized because we see it every day working with our physicians and how they interact with their patients and the things that they're able to do for their patients that are just incredible that they wouldn't necessarily experience in the traditional medical uh, industry. Um, we also have an ability to both contain costs and provide better healthcare experience. And so that's really, uh, you know, a big portion of what direct primary care is, is the cost saving measure. It's not cost saving by, um, by, by holding back service, it's actually cost savings by allowing patients to, to connect with a physician that they uh, feel strongly about, that they can build a big, uh, you know, really strong relationship with. And then it also solves the access problem. So patients don't have to wait three weeks. They can interact with their doctor freely whenever they feel like a need, there's a need. Um, and the, the physicians have the time and, and the ability to be able to do that as well. So problem, some of the problems holding growth back. So again, we're in introductory phase, we're gonna get to growth. So there's incredible risk, I think, for physicians that are looking to do DPC. And it's essentially a risk of quitting your job and starting a business. And so not everyone's really in tune to doing that. And there's families of, you know, families to support and mouths to feed and all those things. And there's a lot of, uh, you know, physicians that are unhappy with what, where they're at right now, but it provides a living. And so DPC is a really attractive model. It just, there's immense risk to be able to do it. There's no organized support structure. So those physicians that are going into DPC for the most part are practicing on an island. Uh, they may have uh, connections with certain DPC practices uh, other, in other places of the country. They have access to DPC Facebook groups. But outside of that, there's really no coordinated effort and support structure. And there's no, essentially no network effect to leverage. And it's not just about shared pricing. It's about shared uh, experience. It's about shared knowledge. Uh, it's about the coordination aspect like Rashid talked about. So those things are very important. So our vision to move DPC forward in figuring this out, we asked ourselves, how do we get physicians who want to move into the model the best opportunity possible? So essentially eliminate that risk. The second is how do we build a solid foundation for DPC, DPC to scale? And that's where we get to the growth phase. 
is how do we scale it? And is it through the truly independent practices or is it through a coordinated effort of shared knowledge and experience? So before I move on, the rules that I think these are really important. So the rules that we live by and, and we're structured as a company like this because I wanna emphasize the fact that we don't hire physicians. We enable physicians to be able to go into the DPC model. And so it's a best of both worlds approach. And so we're the support structure, we're the bubble that protects those practices and we're the bubble that coordinates those. But the first thing is physicians are in control. So everything that we do has to provide value to the physicians or the patient. And there's always gonna be that firewall between us and the practices. And that firewall is the independence. And so, um, you know, I'll, I'll share kind of experiences some of the other physicians have had being an employee in an environment very similar to DPC is that those things start blurring and, and, and the employer starts putting pressure on the practices maybe to produce more, to see more patients. And it's inevitable. You know, they're, we're, um, you know, they're all companies that are looking to make money and they want to get the most out of their, uh, out of their uh, providers. Um, but these practices are really built for the physician in mind. And then it's full DPC or bus. So we don't work with uh, hybrid practices. We don't um, advocate for hybrid practices. I think it's a good, uh, it, it's, it's a, it's an idea for physicians to kind of get into DPC slowly and still maintain relationship with the fee-for-service world. The problem with that is you don't start seeing the benefits of direct primary care until you're fully on direct primary care. And so we can help you go full DPC and the patients, the physician, and everyone involved will benefit from the full DPC structure versus a hybrid structure. So our process for growing direct primary care. So we take a, a very market by market approach. And what that means is we look for those partners that understand what direct primary care is. So we're on the primary care side, we're very solidly on the primary care side. And we need those partners that have a connection to the employer side or, um, well, let's focus on employers right now, but really have that tied to the employer side. And to do that, they have to understand how to structure DPC in, a, in an employer's benefits package. So the employee benefits package uh, that employee gets, how does DPC fit and how to maximize it? So how does it fit with um, you know, those things that are outside of direct primary care, really to work in unison to help those employers save money and yet provide just incredible opportunities for employees because now they're, they're, uh, their primary care may be completely paid for, they have full access. Uh, it's really a win-win. So we partner with a benefits consultant. Um, and typically those benefits consultants are those that are really aligned with direct primary care. And they're not everywhere. Direct primary care, again, we're in the introductory phase. So right now we're going with the first movers and those people that really understand it. And so we work with them and they tell us, we have, we have communication back and forth. They tell us where they feel like we need to find a doctor to place a practice. And we tell them where we have physicians that are interested in, in launching practices because then they can go out and they can talk to employers because then the direct primary care is real at that point. There's a lot of benefits consultants that are talking about DPC. The problem is without having that doctor at least raise their hand and say, I'm interested and be part of that conversation uh, in, some, in some form then we can, we can accelerate that together. So at that point, if we have opportunities, we know that we need to start attracting and vetting physicians. And really what we're looking for is our doctors, primary care doctors, internists, uh, DOs, MDs, uh, you know, those that are on, in the primary care side that are really, that really want to practice for their patients. And so they want to spend time, they want the autonomy to practice, but they also want the support. They also want the, you know, the shared resources. They want the shared knowledge. Um, they want access to other DPCs that they can collaborate with. And so those are the physicians that we're looking for. And then we go through the process of actually launching, supporting, coordinating, like Rashid talked about, um, when launching these practices. So that's kind of the foundational aspect is getting the practices built, finding them a location. And I talk a lot about our ecosystem. And so our ecosystem is not, you know, is those five things that Dr. Patel talked about, but it's also access to capital. It's also access to real estate resources. And so those things are partners of ours that we help those physicians be able to um, have access to those things. And our partners understand direct primary care. 
So on the real estate side, if they're looking for a space, we guide them with uh, what they should be looking for. So they have an idea of what direct primary care is and the spaces that are not only uh, you know, efficient for those individuals, cost effective, um, but uh, you know, those that are, uh, well, essentially cost effective and are, and are efficient and, uh, and, and useful for those individuals. So, so I wanna talk about, this is one example that I'm gonna kind of illustrate how this works out. So I have a connection with a benefits consultant in North Carolina. And this benefits, benefits consultant, we had a conversation and asked him, so you know, he's really bought into direct primary care and actually deployed direct primary care with employers in other areas of the country. Now, typically what that looks like is a one-to-one -one relationship. I find an employer, they find an employer, and they find a practice and they link the two together. Uh, you know, unfortunately with scaling direct primary care, that becomes very difficult because if you have one employer with four or five practices, who's coordinating that? And that's kind of the role that we, that we, uh, that we play. So this is about a 500 person employer just northeast of Charlotte and looking for direct primary care practices to be able to give employees at this company choice, but allows the benefits consultant to be able to integrate that into the, to the benefits plan. Now, DPC, is a short-term cost savings for an employer, but it's also a long-term cost saver. So it may not, you know, first year may see dramatic decreases due to DPC or other strategies. Um, it could be reference-based pricing or direct contracting with hospitals for those more expensive things. What DPC will do over time is reduce cost and, and cap that cost and, and maybe hold it flat or hold it negative, which is unheard of in um, employee benefits at this time. And so what we did is we, we got an idea for what the uh, map looked like. So what you'll see is it kind of looks like a, uh, like a weather radar. So you'll see the light green areas, the red dots are patients, the dark blobs are concentrations of patients and where they live. And so we use this to be able to find physicians and, and, and link them to these opportunities. And so the blue circles, the dots in the circle, uh, are where the pra practices are within a 20 mile radius. So the blue dot is where the practice is and the circle around it is the 20 mile radius uh, to be able to serve with those, those. And so what we do when we, when we launch this with uh, the employer is that we open up the network to, and the network, I mean community, of all of, of our DBC practices that work with us and allow the individual to be able to choose the doctor that best fits them. And so this is what we're looking at doing in multiple areas. And as we grow and as we add more practices to the map, it becomes easier and easier to, to scale up the number of employers that are part of this because the network exists. Uh, and then it just creates more and more opportunities for doctors to be able to, to go into the direct primary care model without taking on just that immense risk that they take on today. So some of the opportunities right now, so let's go over the opportunities that exist uh, and typically they're gonna be in the East Coast right now. Um, but opportunities in North Carolina. So Salisbury, North Carolina is an area that we have a need for immediately. And it allows, uh, we actually already have spaces working with our real estate partners and possibly even access to capital um, to be able to launch these practices quickly and then hyper accelerate the growth of the practices through, uh, through employer groups. And it doesn't necessarily mean that the practice will be filled with one employer group. Um, typically we try to avoid that, um, but we wanna diversify the patient base. So whether it's uh, retail consumers, so people walking in through the street or finding you online, it could be, uh, or it can be employer groups or it could be health shares or anything like that. Um, uh, Albemarle, Wadesboro are two really good opportunities as well. So those are about uh, outside different areas of Charlotte. Uh, Morgan to North Carolina, which is a great, uh, you know, a great place just outside of the mountains in North Carolina between, sh between Charlotte and, uh, and Asheville. And then we're always looking for doctors in Charlotte, North Carolina. Um, but the, right now the immediate need is Salisbury. Uh, and then probably with a, you know, a, a three month, a three month span, uh, Albemarle, Wadesboro, Morganton, those are opportunities that we want to start talking to doctors uh, about today. And then also statewide. So as we scale this, we work with benefits consultants. We spread the word about the benefits of working with DPC on the employer side. Uh, this will just continue to grow. And then that's what's going to take us from the introductory phase to growth. And we'll start exploding this. 
Now, just to kind of give you an idea, working with some of these benefits consultants, what they what what they do for their employer groups that they're clients of, um, that are clients of the benefits consultant. So the savings are immense by going to direct primary care and, and implementing other strategies, looking at direct primary care as almost the hub of the benefit structure. We're seeing 30, 40, 50% reduction in savings. There's an area of Anderson County, South Carolina, that's seeing a 60% savings in the first eight months, year over year. And so, so this is just, it's too hard uh, to be able to ignore. And um, it just takes the right people to be able to take what we have and then coordinate with the health plan. And then we share a lot of that because we're always part of that discussion with the employer. We also loop in some of our physicians to be able to part of that, be part of that discussion too, because it's, I think it's important for the employer to understand the process. So those are, that's North Carolina. Uh, Indiana, so we're in Indianapolis. And so the opportunities here will just continue to grow. But we have three to four physicians in North Central Indiana. So if those people that are familiar with Indiana could be uh, Tipton, um, Kokomo, Muncie, Anderson. Um, but they're going to be uh, kind of in more, I guess, third tier markets here in Indiana. Uh, probably uh, areas of 10 to 20 to 30,000 people. And typically those areas are also underserved a choice for those uh, for, for residents of those areas too. So DPC is a really good uh, community resource. South Bend, Indiana. So that's gonna be an opportunity that's gonna present itself. Right now we have a, a group of about 300 individuals, um, but that would be a Q1 2020. And then other areas statewide. So it's always good to understand where the areas of focus are and then get physicians to say, I'm interested. And then we put them in the map and then communicate that back and forth with our partners on the employer side. Other opportunities. So Virginia, Harrisonburg, Virginia. Um, that's an opportunity to jump right in uh, with a partner of ours. Um, Georgia, so Southern Georgia, Savannah. Uh, those are areas that we'll be developing here very shortly. We're working with a large number uh, of, of people in South, Southern Georgia that are huge advocates of drug primary care. They just can't find the opportunities, and that's where kind of where we where we fit in. Uh, Charleston, South Carolina, statewide in South Carolina. So North Carolina, South Carolina, Indiana. Um, right now, are our number one focuses, and that that will most likely spread as time goes on. So we'll just continue to add to this map and opportunities that that pop up. So if you have more questions on um, on anything that Dr. Patel or I talked about today. Uh, you can email me. Uh, here's my email address. Um, feel free to ask any questions. We'll we'll take some time, I think, to address questions here. Um, but yeah, please do. Please email me if there's anything that's not addressed or you want to learn a little bit more about something. Thanks. So I guess on to questions. Yeah. Thanks, Jason. So um, we do have kind of our first question uh, that was asked about how do we attract patients for our practices. So and it was really asked in three buckets. So for individuals and families small groups, and then for large self-funded clients. So I'll take the first two and then I'll, I'll turn it over to you to talk about the large self-funded clients. But uh, when we open a practice, you know, there are a number of ways of attracting patients, um, individual families, or even some of the small groups. And what really seems to work the best uh, when we look at kind of what, what gets the most bang for our buck with ad dollars, um, what, one is online advertising. So making sure you have a great website, great social media presence, maybe spend a little bit of money into like Google AdWords, maybe some Facebook advertising. Um, Melissa keeps talking to us about Instagram advertising, but, um, but that seems to be the best bang for the buck. So some of the things like radio advertisements, television advertisements, they tend to be a little bit more pricey and maybe you don't get quite the return on that than you would for some of the smaller ticketed items. Um, the other thing is really being a presence in, in your community. So, um, you know, I, I uh, practice in a suburb of Indianapolis and I uh, am a member of the Chamber of Commerce there. Um, they had a farmer's market over the summer. So we kind of rented a booth out there a few Saturdays to kind of go talk to the community, pass out flyers. This is where you not only can get um, individuals and families, but you can get some small groups as well. Because as you talk to other business owners and you talk to um, the people in your Chamber of Commerce, and you just ask them about their situations. So how, what are you doing for your employees? Maybe you don't offer benefits at all. Uh, maybe the benefits have gotten really expensive and maybe direct primary care might be a way to, to solve that. And so you just kind of open those doors and it's a lot of education up front, but I think that's where we get a lot of traction with uh, getting some of those families and individuals and then some of those small groups. Then the, the thing after that, once you have a, a core of patients is really the word of mouth. 
So once you provide great service and um, are, are doing a, a great job taking care of those patients, um, it should then uh, lead to better word of mouth referrals and uh, will help uh, grow your practice from that standpoint. So that, that's kind of what we do with individuals, families, and small groups. And Jason, if you want to take over, how do we handle large self-funded clients? Um, you can kind of shed some light on that. Yeah, I mean, large self-funded clients, I guess the question is, what's, what's large? So in northern Indiana, we're working with an opportunity with about 1,500 individuals, individual lives. So that's employees and their, and their, and their families. Um, in that case, it's really working very closely with the benefits consultant. In that case, it's Eric Dreyfus, and he's a Health Rosetta certified um, benefits consultant. And so uh, working with him very closely uh, on planning um, not only where to put practices, how to roll it out, how to onboard uh, these employees, um, and all of those things. So, um, you know, for us, we're, we're, we're part of the process. We're not driving the process. So the person that's driving is typically the benefits consultant. So it makes, it makes a lot of sense for us to work very closely with them. So it's, it's truly a partnership and we're helping Eric succeed or, or the person we're working with in that area and they're helping us succeed. It's a win-win in that case. Okay. Jason, I'm going to toss up another question to you. Um, there's a question that's kind of a two-parter. They kind of work together. Um, but are the employers that we work with, are they only self-funded plans or um, could they be a little smaller and use maybe like a level funded plan like we have with National General or, or Allied? Yeah. So that's a good question. Um, so uh, on the insurance side, it only makes sense to work with uh, health plans where there's some incentive somewhere to work with DPC. And so what that means is, and, and what you'll see typically is that you're not gonna, you're not gonna have fully insured individuals. So like a traditional health plan, that's that, that where, where DPC is a part of that component. And that's because there's no shared savings. DPC is a huge cost saver. And so uh, it, it makes sense for the employer to have some skin in the game to be able to reap some of that benefit. In a fully insured plan, uh, it just means that the insurance company is going to be saving money. Um, but that doesn't mean we only work with self, self-funded or partially self-funded. We work with level funding, which is on the smaller side, so up to 50 employees. It's kind of emulates self-funded. Um, self-funded is really the standard. There's a huge amount of strategy just outside of that um, that allows... Um, um, that, that really allow uh, DPC to work well. And that can also mean health share. So health shares are becoming very popular among small groups as well. And so the nice thing about health share is they're also connected to DPC. So they're kind of built around each other. And so what makes sense and kind of what we're working at is building kind of a clean, uh, you know, clean sheet type of health plan that includes DPC as, as a center hub and other strategies as those spokes. And it all works in concert together. Uh, including the coordination with us, because we work a lot with the employer ongoing, on an ongoing basis too, and provide them the data and the insight they need to be able to make crucial decisions about this. If that makes sense. Yeah, definitely. So um, we, we had a question on here, what is the ratio of EEs or E's to doctors? I, I'm not exactly sure what is meant by that, so if you could clarify what that is. Um, the second part of the question is, do we use NPs? Um, what I will say is currently in, in most of our practices, we don't use physician extenders. Uh, we use most physician, mostly all, all physicians, MDs or DOs, and then we usually when we grow, we'll add in another partner. Um, most of the thought there is that having a partner that can then be your true equal to share a call with and to do uh, most other tasks with makes it more efficient than using a physician extender. That being said, we do have one practice. They, they actually have three physicians and a, a nurse practitioner. So I think once you get to a certain size, it may make sense to, um, to add, add in a, a physician extender of some type. And thank you for that clarification. So the question is, what is the ratio of employees to doctors in our practices? So Jason, I'll uh, turn this over to you if, you if there's something that you have uh, worked with and I can answer from a, from a physician standpoint of what we think. Yeah, so just to clarify, we, we don't work exclusively with employers. It's, it's patients of any level. So it could be groups of health share. Um, we're working with partnership with, with, a, with a health share um, of groups, uh, thousands of individuals and being able to, to provide um, you know, a, a direct primary care uh, to those areas of demand. But as far as total patients go, so usually the, the, 
you know, the, uh, the ratio is about five to 600 patients per one physician. And that can, you know, that can uh, go up or down depending on what the physician's you know, level of comfort is on those numbers. And so we have physicians that have young families. They want a really good, you know, all, all of our physicians have really, really good work-life balances. And Dr. Tal can kind of attest to that. Um, but maybe some practices only want to see 400 patients. Maybe they only want to do it part-time. Maybe some practices have the ability to um, utilize uh, extenders or, or uh, bring in other physicians as partners um, to be able to, uh, you know, see more patients. So really kind of the sweet spot is between five and 600, but that can vary. Yeah, I will say, um, you know, as a, as a physician doing a DPC practice that I, I, I'd say maybe in that six to 800 range is, is like a fairly typical number where we, when we talk to DPC physicians about where they want to be in the practice. And the nice thing about our model is we have the ability to to get those patients from a number of sources. So um, I have a, a number of patients that I just kind of found us off, off the street. They're just an individual or a family um, or maybe a very small group. We can have patients that come from employers. And, and the thing that we would really like to do is not have too many patients from any one source. So if we have an employer, if you were able to get one or 200 patients from that source, that probably is maybe all we want. And we'd rather than have another employer where we have another one or 200 uh, patients from. So we're able to share those employees amongst multiple offices and make sure that our patient base isn't solely reliant on any one source. Um, if something happens, if the employer goes out of business or if they change their mind, I don't want my office to be crippled because uh, something that's a little bit out of my control. So we try to share that around and so um, kind of bring in patients from a number of sources, but around that 600, 800 range is probably a fairly typical number. Um, a follow-up question is, what is the uh, per employee per month cost um, that we charge? So Jason, do you want to touch on this of how we set up that uh, cost structure for, our, for the employees that we work with? Yeah, so it really depends on the situation in that case. Now, our model is really, uh, is really driven towards um, you know, providing the value for the physicians. And that, that's typically, there's, there's a certain amount of buy-in for those physicians to be part of the community that we have. Um, but then we provide other things for the employer, like the coordination, the, the data, uh, and some other things. Um, and the PPM is gonna, is gonna vary. We haven't really necessarily settled on that just yet, but uh, it'll, be a, it'll be a nominal amount, I think, for the most part. Okay, yep, so it kind of varies a little bit. Um, so another question we have is, what do we do with, um, when a patient needs ancillary services like chiropractor, PTOT, or behavioral health? Um, and, and we can really handle this, I'll, I'll take this from the physicianal, physician answer our side. Um, it, it, we handle it in a number of ways. So if we're working with an employer, they may have some services set up where we kind of build it into the health plan that we have a certain, whether it's a chiropractor, therapy session, or therapy location, um, or a behavioral health provider that has been kind of set up in the plan that we would then use and, and send their patients that way. Um, otherwise, if let's say it's just one of my individual patients that um, we uh, can you know use to, to need some of the services, we'll kind of look at in the community. So if they have their own insurance, we'll kind of see maybe what coverage they have to use that. Um, or we kind of really always work to find if, if a patient is, let's say, uninsured or they have a really high deductible or they're in a health share where they're gonna be paying a lot of, out of pocket, We'll try to find those locations that have really good cash pricing for some of those, so some of those items, and uh, do what we can to get them to the right place so they're not um, spending a lot of money uh, on those items. And then the question after that is, um, do we do the occupational health for for these uh, employers as well? We we typically don't. So we typically are, are more of the health plan benefit. Um, most of the employers will have their separate um, uh, workman's comp insurance where they have their own occupational health providers that is set up through that insurance plan. So we really serve as the health insurance plan. Now, that, that doesn't mean that sometimes patients who have an occupational health issue end up in our office, but uh, we usually try to steer away from being the occupational health center for those types of claims. Um, we just kind of really focus on the, on the healthcare side of it. Um, let's see. So the question is, if we have a, an established uh, insurance-based practice and they're using a nurse practitioner currently, and if you decide to do DPC, is that going to be a problem continuing with your current NP? Um, it really doesn't have to be. Um, when we have these transition practices where you have a practice and you may have a full panel of patients already, and you're gonna transition over to DPC, um, we kind of have some calculations of where do we think 
um, the, what, what percentage of patients are going to move over into that membership model. So it really then becomes about the, the, the expenses and, and kind of the revenue of where you're going to be um, when you make that transition and, and is that going to be sustainable for you to, to start. So we kind of do know most offices that make the transition um, don't need as much staff as they had. So I know in a traditional office, you may have a front office staff and back office staff and billers and coders and all those things. And with a DPC office, you just don't need that much staff. And so the same thing might be true with providers. I think it just depends on how big your panel is. And again, how many patients we think are gonna move over to, to kind of fill up your panel or, or to kind of share between you and a nurse practitioner. So it's not a deal breaker by any means, but it does take a little bit of work to kind of figure that out in terms of uh, how, uh, how to make that work. Yeah, I wanna address, um, and I think I may have misunderstood George's question. So uh, George, if you can answer this, so are you talking about the price for the individual? So uh, to be part of the practice, are you talking about our costs? Anyway, I'll move on. If you wanna, if you wanna answer that question, uh, I'll move on to Peter's. Um, and his question is what, what resources do you provide or utilize for cash pay pricing and or bundled payment arrangements? I'm not, under, I'm not sure, uh, you know, for our practices, for an adult or family, they're flat rate. And so that depends on the practice. So, so again, the practices are independent. We help guide them to be able to price their practices competitively. Uh, a practice depends on the market. So it's gonna be anywhere between 50 to $75 a month uh, uh, for an individual. And that may answer your question, George. Uh, that, that's gonna be probably in the range that those practices will be. And again, if you're gonna be, it depends on cost, uh, cost of operating a business. And so if it's in, uh, a more metro area, a more high demand area, those prices may go a little bit higher. But again, that's up to the practice. And that's part of where we don't dictate pricing on the practice side. We help guide them to be able to, um, to, be able to provide what's, what the market's really looking for. So uh, it's a lot of value um, for the individual because it's not just having access to office hours, it's having access to your physician. It could be smartphone interaction or video visits or all of those things. Yep. So the question from somebody different was uh, about cash pay pricing of uh, how do we um, provide or utilize uh, resources for that and then uh, do we bundle some of that in so what we have done in our practice is really try to go out and find some of those cash uh, price uh, locations and then we kind of uh, with Freedom Health Works are able to share and uh, inform the rest of our physicians about some of those resources so uh, maybe it's certain imaging centers maybe there's certain providers who will do cash pricing for a colonoscopy for example uh, maybe some physical therapy locations that have cash pricing so we try to find those out in a certain market and we then can really focus on getting our, uh, our other DPC practices to, to use that. Um, I think what's happened with um, at the employer level, some of these things can get bundled into the health plan as well. And that usually is part of a third party administrator. Jason, you can kind of go into that a little bit as well, but I think they will try to go out and negotiate some of the pricing for this as well, for some of those things when it's bundled into a health plan. Yeah, and that could be from the, that could be from the, uh, uh, from the benefits consultant side, it could be from the TPA. And so, so they're, they're going out and they're trying to extend uh, the transparency, the pricing, um, that DPC is getting on a larger scale. So working with maybe specific hospitals in the area um, to be able to provide that. Okay, hopefully, hopefully that answers the question. Um, other questions, we have a few more minutes that so we can uh, be happy to stay on and answer questions here. Well, just in case if, if there are no other questions, we do wanna thank everyone for joining us today on the webinar. Um, we are gonna get a couple emails after this. We have a quick survey that we'd love to get some feedback on the webinar. And so we hope you take a couple minutes to, to answer that. Um, you'll get another email with our contact information. So feel free to reach out to myself or to Jason uh, anytime with questions that you may have, and we're happy to answer those as well. Um, so if any of you need to jump off, if you have one o'clock patients or need to, to get off uh, to do anything else, uh, feel free to do that. We'll hang out here for a few more minutes. So if there's any other questions, feel free to add them on. And we'll be happy to keep answering them. Patients are going to DPC because I see a lot of doctors that don't have access to their patient panel. And so uh, assuming that you do, again, that's a, that's a game changer for you. Well, we are just a little bit past the hour here. So I think we are going to sign off. Feel free if there's any other questions to reach out to us by email and we'll be happy to answer them. And again, we thank you guys very much again for joining us. And